Tena koto, ko Stefan Kornahar, kia ora. Uh, morena, good morning and a warm welcome to you all. Whether you're joining us from your office or your couch, tena koto. My name is Stefan Korn. I'm the General Manager, Market Engagement Experience and Sectors at Callahan Innovation. And I'm delighted to welcome you today to our first ever clean tech event. Clean tech is a real and growing business opportunity. At Callahan Innovation, we're helping develop a globally competitive clean tech ecosystem in New Zealand, producing businesses that develop innovative offerings, provide meaningful jobs, and solve the climate crisis, water quality, resource use problems for New Zealand, and importantly, the world. New Zealand is currently 22nd on the Clean Tech Group's Innovation Index a global forecast of which countries are most likely to produce commercial clean tech startups over the next 10 years. Callahan Innovation has set an ambitious goal to boost New Zealand into the top 10 by 2022 and to increase the number of New Zealand's $100 million plus clean tech businesses. New Zealand's small scale R&D expertise in niche areas and environmental challenges make it an ideal testing ground for clean tech innovations. But it is crucial that businesses think big with a view toward global exp expansion. We are committed to supporting businesses not only to test their clean tech innovations locally, but to build these innovations into commercial businesses that can be taken to the world stage and to support our COVID-19 economic recovery. As Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said in her 2020 victory speech, building back better after COVID-19 includes protecting New Zealand's environment, addressing the country's climate crisis. Callahan Innovation's first ever clean tech report, New Zealand Clean Tech for the World, the New Waste to Value, highlights New Zealand's strong position to convert these urgent problems into profitable clean tech businesses, particularly in the waste to value space. James Muir will talk, about, will talk more about this shortly. We've supported many successful businesses in these areas, such as Mint Innovation, which uses microbes to recover precious metals from electronic waste, and Citizen, which turns waste bread into nutritious and delicious new food products that are now in market. Such innovations reflect the type of out-of-the-box thinking we need to tackle growing environmental concerns. Long-term and sustainable change won't come from regulations alone. The scale of transformation we need requires a collaborative approach. Collaboration is a key theme in our clean tech report and is an essential part of New Zealand Inc.'s vision to strengthen the clean tech ec ecosystem. The relationships between organizations such as Callahan Innovation, NZTE, Zion, the Ministry for the Environment, investors and others not only allow us to help businesses get the support they need to grow and accelerate, but also enable us to drive change that benefits all New Zealanders and the environment. So in closing, thanks again for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the thought-provoking discussion and that it inspires you to consider how you and your business can help protect our precious environment. I'd like to hand over to our Energy and Environment Business Innovation Advisor, James Muir, to provide a snapshot of the recently released clean tech report, New Zealand Clean Tech for the World, the New Ways to Value. Kena tapu, kena mana, kena ihi, kena wehi. Nga monga whakehi i wainanui i a koto. No piki mai, no kaki mai, hari mai, koto katoa. Welcome to everybody to all the leaders out there, to all the authorities out there, to your essential life forces, to your awesomeness, and the sacred mountains that bind us together. Welcome to everyone, to each and every one of you. So thank you, Stefan, for those opening comments. Before we get into the report, and indeed the panel discussion, a couple of housekeeping notes. This is an online virtual interactive event, and we're really keen to get your questions, and so that the panel can answer those. So we've got some dedicated Q&A segments throughout this session. And what we've got to help you do this is the Zoom Q&A module, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Put your questions in there at any time, and we'll get round to answering them during those dedicated Q&A segments. 
Now we've also got a chat module. We're going to keep this for general thoughts and information throughout the event. So this is also located on your screen now. So we'd really like to hear your thoughts during the event and on social as well. So don't forget to use the hashtag, hashtag cleantech. So first up, I'm about to dive into the poll, but before we get, I'm about to dive into the report, but before we go there, let's do a brief poll. So the poll is, 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 is coming up now. Um, and the question is, which area of New Zealand clean tech is most important to you? Is it climate tech? Is it clean water tech? Smart resource use or something else? Input your selection and we'll circle back later in the event to check on the results. So last week on the 18th of November 2020, we launched our first ever clean tech report to showcase successful waste to value businesses. If you haven't had a chance to see the report, well, we've put in a link to the report right now, so check it out uh, and let us know what you think. Back to the fundamentals. Clean tech, we believe, is a real and growing business opportunity. And the report, The New Waste to Value, is designed to inspire and guide clean tech innovators. Let's, let's, let's pedal back to why this is so interesting to, to New Zealand and indeed the world. First up is that there is a really strong and growing investor interest in clean tech. Let's look at some of the numbers. So um, a recent study by PwC found that venture capital in, clean, in climate tech is growing three times faster than that in artificial intelligence and five times faster than the average growth in venture capital. Another stat is back in 2013, early stage venture funding for climate tech companies was, was about half a billion US dollars. By the time we got to 2019, this had grown to about $16 billion. Clearly a significant increase. And now let's just think about multinationals. So globally, COVID-19 has slowed down some clean tech initiatives by multinationals, but still very significant, significant initiatives continue to be announced. For example, we've got Amazon's $2 billion climate pledge, We've got Microsoft's $1 billion climate innovation. I've got Unilever's another billion dollar, billion dollars in climate funds. So what does this mean? What we're seeing is that multinationals are getting really interested in solving environmental challenges. And they are looking more and more to invest in innovations from external sources. And this is contributing to an increased engagement with small and large businesses outside of these multinationals. Let's move on to some definitions. So what do we mean at Callaghan Innovation by New Zealand Clean Tech? For Callaghan, New Zealand Clean Tech is about successful New Zealand businesses that invest in research and development to create innovative products, processes, and services that address three major environmental challenges, the climate crisis, water pollution and shortages, and unsustainable resource use. Now, critically, this is about creating successful businesses and solving environmental problems, not just in New Zealand, but globally as well. We believe that New Zealand has a number of competitive advantages in clean tech, including an increasing awareness of and a deeper, more authentic, authentic engagement with Kaitiaki Tana, the Maori worldview of how we interact with the environment. Another advantage is New Zealand's track record of developing and being the test bed for novel weird technologies that have significant commercial scale. This includes our international reputation and leading research and development for our primary industries and products. And lastly, New Zealand's awareness that clean tech provides some of the solutions for our greatest environmental challenges and at the same time provides New Zealand with an important opportunity to grow our economy post COVID. The report we launched last week focuses on one category of clean tech namely waste to value. So what is waste to value? In summary, waste to value involves turning waste streams into revenue streams. Our report explores industrial waste to value and biological waste to value in more detail. There are other types of waste to value innovation, but we chose these two areas because they present significant commercial and environmental opportunities for New Zealand innovators. The report includes case studies of successful businesses and how Callaghan Innovation, together with other organization, activated their innovation and accelerated their growth. And here's an example of one of those case studies. This is zinc covering. 
winner of Callahan Innovations Environmental Innovation C Prize 2020. Zinc Covery is all about solving problems for the steel galvanizing industry worldwide. Zinc Covery has developed a novel process to economically recover the zinc and regenerate the acid during the steel galvanizing process. The company's technology and business model has enormous commercial potential and once at scale will dramatically reduce the amount of zinc and acid that ends up in landfill and wastewater, not just in New Zealand, but globally. So our Environmental Innovation C Prize is part of New Zealand Inc's two-year plan to strengthen the clean tech ecosystem. As Stefan noted earlier, New Zealand can take the lead on clean tech globally. Callahan Innovation, together with other organizations, are working together to set up the conditions for New Zealand businesses, large and small, established and startup, to create and grow clean technologies. For this reason, our chief executive, Vic Crone, has laid down the challenge for New Zealand to be in the top 10 clean tech countries by 2022. C Prize's focus on environmental innovation, the new waste to value report, today's event all feed into this significant and ambitious goal. And early next year, we'll be further building on this work by assessing global opportunities for climate technologies and continuing to build and deliver on the two year plan to strengthen New Zealand's clean tech ecosystem. But this work isn't about clean tech businesses. It isn't just about Callahan Innovation. It's about working together as NZ Inc. This slide shows just some of the organizations and people that have assisted the waste to value businesses in the report. One of the key findings of the new waste to value report is that it takes a village to create and grow New Zealand clean tech for the world. Such collaboration activates innovation and accelerates the growth of clean tech businesses helping them to develop profitable and scalable solutions for the pressing environmental challenges that we're all facing. So now I'd like to open up the conversation to you, our online audience, and invite any questions or comments around the report. Please pop them in the Q&A module, and we'll take it from there. Okay, so we've got a <clears throat> couple of questions here. Um, okay, how can clean tech businesses improve their chance of securing investors? Okay, so it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's an interesting question, thank you for that. The, the, the first thing is to really understand the niche that you are targeting in a way that nobody else understands it, to get a really, really deep understanding of the particular problem held by, by your particular early adopter customers. And then to fully understand that problem and then create the solution and to continuously iterate between the problem and the solution that you have. Another, another um, aspect of this is to ensure that the solution is uh, defendable and unique. And that's why at Callahan Innovation, we're all about research and development and protecting that through intellectual property rights such as patents. Uh, there's another question here from Stephanie. How do we ensure that today's economically viable waste to value enterprises don't lock in high upstream resource use by being dependent on inward waste flows? Are we developing companion strategies around bridging approaches to reducing upstream resource use? Oh, thanks, Stephanie, for that. That's, um, that's that's, a, that's an excellent question, and I could probably unpack part of it. So I'll come to the are we developing companion strategies about bridging approaches to reduce upstream resource use. Um, I think the short answer to that is, is yes, um, and that is part of um, the joy of working as NZ Inc., getting a number of government agencies together on this, including Ministry for the Environment, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, uh, Ministry of Primary Industries. And perhaps one more question uh, from Anonymous. Um, how can Maori businesses and iwi be part of this initiative in real terms as part of their own Kaiti Akitanga? Um, well, a, a great question. Um, it's something that we are really, really focused on. First of all, we have, we, our, our data suggests that there's a very low uh, engagement from Maori businesses in this space, and it's something we're actively 
working on. Um, and in terms of how we can make this happen, well, what, what I would encourage you to do is get, is get in touch with Callahan Innovation because we have this two-year plan, and part of that is engaging specifically with Maori businesses. Um, and we would love to connect you, uh, to introduce you to our uh, science and engineering teams as well. Okay, any more questions? Ah, okay, got a couple of good ones here. Okay, who measures the global clean tech index? Okay, so we've said that we're going to go from being 22 position, 22 country in the world on the clean tech index. That was back in 2017 to top 10 in 2022. There is a group um, which is based in the UK and the USA called the Clean Tech Group. Um, and, they, and they run this index uh, periodically. So it's an, it's an independent group. Um, and the methodology is, is very visible, it's very transparent, and it brings together a number of different factors, including um, some, some basics like um, how much renewable energy does a country use, together with more in-depth data such as how many environmental patents were granted uh, to inventors in a particular country, what were the volumes of venture capital funds flowing into clean tech businesses. One last question. Okay, what do you see as the biggest barriers for New Zealand businesses to be successful in clean tech, local and internationally? Well, this is, this is a great question and one we're gonna ask, ask the panel. Um, what I would say on that is, I know, what I would say on that is, it, it's the tension between being a really innovative economy uh, which wants to do things smartly. So as Sir Paul Callahan was saying in the, open, in the opening video, it's not like we should be looking at utilizing New Zealand's physical resources, but our creative resources, our intellectual resources, and our educational resources to develop innovations which we can then take to the world. And one more from Richard. Um, what makes industrial and biological waste to value areas uh, of opportunity? Um, thanks, Richard, good question. The nice thing about industrial waste of value and biological waste of value, and sometimes we contrast that with, say, domestic, domestic waste of value, is that there are relatively large volumes of waste um, which are homogeneous, i.e. The, there's, there's, there's a large amount of feedstock to actually go into a process, and hence there's a the potential of commercial, uh, commercial scale from this. Okay, so let's take a look at the results of our earlier poll. And we're just coming up with the answers now. Okay, here we go. So interesting, so we had those four areas. We had climate tech, we had clean water tech, smart resource use, and, and other. And it looks like we've got 44% uh, of people saying climate tech is the most important area, followed by smart resource use. Okay, thanks for those questions. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to cross over to our online panel and, and get, into, get into the discussion. I'm delighted to introduce our panelists who will explore their roles as business owners and innovators, how they can help address these urgent global environmental problems and at the same time create successful businesses. So let's introduce our panelists one by one. First off, co-founder and chief technology officer at Tasman Iron, Shalini Divya. Shalini recently completed her PhD, which focused on cathode materials for high performance rechargeable aluminum iron batteries. And she is now working on commercializing the battery technology. And we're very pleased to have you here today, Shalini. Hi, uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's, it's great. Brilliant. <laughs> thank you, Shalini. Um, and next up is uh, Ashton Partridge, Chief Science Officer at Manufacturing Systems Limited. Uh, MSL is a New Zealand business startup with a unique polymer production process. Ashton oversees the team of scientists and engineers translating ideas from the laboratory into commercial products. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Excellent. And Veronica, Veronica Stevenson, she is founder and CEO of Humblebee. Humblebee is a New Zealand biomaterial startup that uses biomimicry to capture information encoded within a solitary bee's genome to create a new plastic that's safer for people and the planet. Thanks, James. Good to be awesome. here. 
And last but not least, we have joining us live from the USA, uh, somewhere near Chicago, is Chief, Science Office, Chief Scientific Officer and co-founder of Lanzatech, Sean Simpson. Lanzatech, Hello, James. Hi, Sean. Lanzatech is a clear example of an industrial waste to value success story. Its technology turns industrial gas into ethanol, which can be used as an energy source such as jet fuel, reducing carbon dioxide emissions. Great. Well, thank you to all the panelists. Great to have you here today. Thank you. OK, so before we kick off, a reminder again about our Q&A module. Pop your questions in there, and we're going to take a break about every 10 minutes to answer some of those questions. Um, also a reminder to use the hashtag, hashtag cleantech. OK, so the, the first question. Um, this is an interesting one uh, because you know, we believe at Callahan Innovation that clean tech is, is front and center. It allows us to solve environmental challenges, create successful businesses, and grow the New Zealand economy post-COVID. But there's always that question about what exactly does success look like for New Zealand clean tech. And so what we're going to do here is just kind of ex examine that from some different perspectives. Um, and Veronica, I'm going to pass that question to you to just begin, begin the discussion. Sure. Uh, I think that the clean green image that we have culturally, um, however tarnished it may be, uh, sits very deeply um, within our nation's culture. And I think that we can not just wait for regulations internationally to trickle down and influence us, we can be world leaders. And I think that New Zealand underestimates um, its ability based on its population and size and geographical proximity. Um, whereas I think our real power is in that culture mm -hmm. um, and in how we want to do things better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I think owning that yeah. would be a real sign of success. Okay. Yeah. And can you just, just expand a bit more? What, what do you mean by owning it? Instead of waiting for international regulations to come in and influence us, yeah. Um, to go, this is who we are as a people, as a country, mm. uh, and then allow that culture to filter outwards yep. and allow the solutions that come from living in a culture like that um, and having infrastructure and support from government and agencies like Callahan Innovation mm. to then be exported. Um, I think that would have an influence on the global trend of clean tech. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So, Shalini, can you, can you sort of pick, pick it up from there? Uh, Veronica's talked about kind of staying ahead of international regulations and kind of tying it perhaps to our national identity mm -hmm. and, and who we are and what we're known for. Um, I think New Zealand has a lot of potential for becoming the innovation hub mm -hmm. of, of the world. Um, we have cutting edge uh, technology and innovations coming out of our universities and maybe not focus so much on becoming the manufacturing hub, but um, if we try to become, you know, um, if we have something like a research, a battery research institute here in New Zealand, where people from all over the world can come and, you know, look forward to solving, um, you know, the science problems. Um, that way, I think New Zealand can put itself out there in the world and uh, become, you know, the face of, of clean tech as well. Yeah, nice. So, so you're talking about perhaps developing some centers of excellence yeah, here as well? Yeah, uh, yeah. And that um, maybe we can focus on, on certain technologies, mm -hmm. you know, like um, if we just focus on some fields of science and not everything, because if we have that pointy end towards technologies, then I think we might do a little more, you know, we can do better. Um, so yeah, if we have those um, research institutes or, you know, um, people usually look forward to going to Europe and Switzerland, you know, to um, solve any of their, I'm going to speak for batteries, of course, uh, when it comes to any battery problem. So why not think of creating some place like that here in New Zealand and then just, you know, create that on the world map yeah. that here in New Zealand we have the world's first, you know, battery research institute or whatnot for New Zealand and maybe go forward from there. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, Sean, I'm going to come to you um, about this question about success. What does success look like for New Zealand clean tech? I mean, from, from our perspective, it's really about impact. How do you take uh, technologies? How do you take innovations locally 
and really ensure that they can have maximum impact on a global scale, on a global stage. Um, uh, for example, in the area of climate change, how do you how do you ensure that those those innovations don't just have a local uh, significance, but have a global significance to to dr dramatically uh, reduce dependence on fossil fuels, dram dramatically reduce uh, CO two emissions? And I think I think New Zealand is a great um, incubator from which such innovations can spring, but a recognition that, uh, that to have impact, those innovations must go offshore and, and, uh, and, and become relevant in, in very large industrial uh, um, uh, regions of the world. Yeah, nice one, Sean. Hey, just while you were talking there, Sean, um, another question came to mind for you. I mean, given that you are, you, you, Landstack is now based in the USA, you started off in New Zealand. Um, you're talking about the importance of, uh, if you want to have impact, basically leaving New Zealand. We'll unpack that a bit later. But I just wondered if you could give us like a, you know, like a brief, perhaps slightly amusing kind of view on how Lanza Tech actually started. What was, you know, what were, can you talk us through the kind of moments of creation? Yeah, sure. So uh, we started in 2005. Um, myself and Richard Forster founded the, the company. And, um, uh, since that time, just to just to put the story a little in perspective, since that time, you know, we now have uh, 200 employees. We have uh, a commercial plant operating in China. And we're constructing uh, several commercial plants around the world. But we actually started in the basement of uh, of of the um, uh, of of uh, a DSIR building, uh, the 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 predecessor to Callahan Innovation, and. Uh, our first um, incubators were were uh, bought from the local dairy. Uh, to uh, we repurposed uh, the refrigerators that uh, that had broken down in uh, dairies from around uh, Auckland, and our first um, uh, microbe incub uh, uh, shakers were actually bought from the barbecue warehouse. Um, we started very very modestly in in that context, and uh, as I say today, we've raised. Over, uh, over, uh, over 350 million US dollars, uh, based on the in innovations that came from that time. Actually, so, so I think in in that context, we're 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 kind of representative of a, of a number eight wire uh, way of thinking, um, but taken to an industrial scale. That's great, Sean. Ashton. Can you pick up the thread on the, you know, what does success look like for NZ CleanTech? Yeah, I think I think must success must include a whole of government approach because we must get the kids being educated in clean tech, you know, whatever whatever type of technology it may be, uh, and then be able to migrate them into industry. I would prefer to think we could have local industry. I mean, Sean's right, you know, it makes complete sense for Lancetech to be offshore. With us, we've got uh, building integrated photovoltaics happening in Texas, yes. But I would like to think we could actually make some industry, grow industry here in New Zealand for our kids to come out of academia, out of the institutes, into, into businesses. And, and so we've got a couple of initiatives which can actually do that. Um, so it depends what success means mm. and who defines that in New Zealand. Yep. Uh, I would suggest we need to grow high-tech industry here yep. to pay for what COVID has taken from us. Mm, 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 anyway, that's mm. my opinion. Yeah, and it, and it seems like a it seems like a, a, a central point is that you know why are we doing this? Yes. You know we, we we would love to have more clean tech jobs in New Zealand. We would love to be get, be a stronger economy. We would love as a nation to improve New Zealand's environment and, and the global environment, but kind of, kind of, how are we doing that, and why are we doing it as well? And one of the examples that we were kind of talking about um, earlier this week was really the example of, of Vestas. Mm. Um, so, you know, Vestas, I, and I'm not too sure on the origins of, of, of Vestas, but as many of you will know, it's a very, very large manufacturer of wind, wind turbines. It started a number of decades ago and has grown to a point where they employ tens and tens of thousands of people. So at, at some point, the people behind Vestas, or perhaps the scientists behind the technology which created Vestas, thought, this is a great idea. This is the future. We can see a free, almost endless, renewable source of fuel. OK, how do we grab hold of that market? And they still dominate the market, even though there's been decades of people competing as well. So how do we create? 
that's sort of the New Zealand version of Vestas as well. And, and, and that would seem like a noble goal to have mm. as well, because obviously it's just not one company. There'll, there'll be a whole bunch of different companies and research and development institutes around Vestas as well. So, um, so I've begun to unpack what success looks like. And I, and I guess the next thing is like, how big could New Zealand clean tech become? How important could it be? And I mean, I think one way of looking at it is to think about the actual size of the markets that each of your companies uh, are looking at uh, as well. Um, there are some huge numbers out there. I was at a presentation recently where one person said it was 23 trillion a year until 2030, and the next person said 8 trillion a year until 2030. And it was like, well, OK, it's, it gets more or less the point of being semi-meaningless, apart from being very large. But mm. I just wonder if we could just kind of go around each of the businesses and just sort of talk about the sort of size of market that, that each of you are in. And then if we scale that up and think about the other NZ clean tech businesses, we'll get a sense of the kind of market size. Um, Shalini? Yeah. Um, so I make batteries, right? And um, any application that you, may, you might think of, um, cars, drones, cell phones, laptops, they all have batteries. And right now we're all progressing towards a cleaner and a greener technology. We are electrifying everything right now. And um, that is why I think the pressure on lithium ion batteries is increasing tremendously, right? Aluminum ion batteries, Tasman ion batteries right now, um, they will be focusing on this one particular niche, uh, maybe commercial drones and e-bikes. And the reason for that is that because the technology of aluminum ion is not, uh, it's right now, it cannot compete with lithium ion. And that is why we want to design batteries that can be used for commercial drones. Recent uh, research and development, when it comes to designing these batteries, it takes a very long time. Lithium ion batteries, they had like 40 years of research mm -hmm. behind them, right? Aluminum ion batteries, the research is still in its infancy. So if we focus on a few applications and then maybe spend another two or three years on designing batteries for hybrid cars, another two or three years for designing batteries for stationary storage, you know? So I mean, I cannot focus on a very large market at the moment, but I'm going to focus on something that is attainable in a few years. Mm. So I think um, it's important that we just make sure that our investors and the consumers are aware, and we are truthful to them, you know, that we are not thinking of oh, replacing lithium ion at the moment. But maybe, you know, if you need a safer or a cheaper um, energy source, then you have this alternative mm. available. Mm. So I think, um, if, if you cater to you know, smaller markets, for someone like me who's just starting up a company, I think that would um, work uh, for me. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, the, the great thing about Tasman Iron is that you've identified the niche. Yeah. And you've been, from, from, what, from our conversation and what I've seen of, of, your, of your company's information, you've really, really understood the problems that people have mm -hmm. with existing batteries, yep. and you've really zoomed into that. You've, yeah. got some, you've got some solid research and development, and you're developing the intellectual property as well. So, yeah, um, we filed the patent last year, mm -hmm. and uh, from that we are trying to you know, commercialize um, this technology and whatnot. Um, it's just that we spoke to a few consumers who use electric bikes, and it was that they want uh, bicycles, electric bikes that are lighter in weight, at the same time, safer. So most of uh, the companies that use lithium ion batteries in their products, they have to pay a very huge price when it comes to you know, making those cargoes safe. So you know, um, entertaining those investors you know, and uh, telling them about that safety prospect mm. of aluminum ion might just work for us at the moment. And then we can think about competing with Tesla, not at the moment. <laughs> Lovely ambition. That's <laughs> yep. great. great. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Sean, let's uh, let's go to the other end of town. Yeah, so uh, Tasman Iron is just being created. Panzer Tech founded 2005. What's your view on how, how big New Zealand clean tech could be? And I and I use the you know that the sort of size and a you can interpret it how, how you feel how you feel fit. I mean, I think I think the the bottom line is that clean tech must be transformative. It must be, it must entirely disrupt the uh, energy, fuel, and manufacturing systems that we have today, it must disrupt farming. It must disrupt 
every aspect of of uh, of society in order that we can transition to to a sustainable future and and therefore you know it it, it can be as big as it needs to be you know i think that uh, i think that it is a, a a dominating and driving force for all industry going forward um there isn't you know if, if you talk to a a shoe manufacturer today, they have a sustainability policy. If you talk to a, a beauty care product manufacturer today, they have a sustainability policy. Um, and, uh, and and this is true, you know, if you talk to a steel manufacturer, they have a sustainability policy. All of these companies, all of these groups, all of these manufacturers, they all need clean tech. And, uh, and for many, the, there is a real challenge in identifying ways that they can move from their current manufacturing um, facilities, their current manufacturing practices, the, the materials they use to, make, to, to, to new materials. Uh, and I don't think there's a sector that's left untouched by this. Uh, and so I think for, for Callahan, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a completely you know, a gravitationally logical move to to focus on clean tech uh, because I think it is the uh, the uh, the mega trend above all other mega trends that will that will drive uh, innovation over the uh, over the coming two three four decades. Yeah. So so how big will it get? It will dominate everything. Great great answer, Sean. And I love love the way there that you're starting to talk about the potential of New Zealand clean tech innovation to, to fundamentally disrupt the economic system that we currently have. Sometimes when we I talk- I don't think there's a choice. Yeah. I don't think there is no choice. It, 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 the, 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 the climate crisis has now been recognized so broadly, so unanimously, uh, and so fundamentally, not just by governments, but by individual companies uh, across you know, every single part of industry such that now real uh, goals are being committed to and real strides are being made in order to uh, in, in order to transform manufacturing systems in order to transform energy systems um, and uh, and deliver to uh, a, uh, a a consumer base that genuinely demands sustainability thanks this is no longer about bio this is about sustainability yeah that's great Sean thank you so much for that um, and Good segue to a, a question from the audience. So Peter Griffin uh, is asking a really interesting question about negative emission technology. So this is, this is an interesting term. Um, I think it reflects just how quickly we're moving from reducing greenhouse gas emissions to actually coming up with products which are negative, i.e. they are not just reducing, but they are removing one way or another. Um, the way he's phrased it is, is this, what work is underway in New Zealand in negative emissions technology? Uh, he's given some examples here, carbon capture and storage, direct capture, carbon scrubbing, etc. cetera. Um, I think we could get into semantics there, what's negative and what's reducing emissions. Um, he's also pointed out that these um, technologies will need to play a role if we are to meet our Paris climate agreement targets. Um, it's really, it's, it's a fascinating question because, you know, there's some really straightforward ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere without any technology. Yeah. Essentially planting indigenous um, trees and, and plants which have a very long life. You know, that, that's a really straightforward to, way to do it. But there is a role for technology as well. So the, the question is, what work is there in negative emissions technology in New Zealand? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm quite happy to, to, to answer that one. Uh, we've heard from a couple of people already, but carbon capture and storage is a really, really fascinating one, which has been on the research and development, uh, the research and development stage for, for a number of years. A number of pilot plants have, have been deployed as well, but it still seems to lack that kind of real, kind of just kind of making good business sense. Um, for some of the reasons which are relatively obvious, there's a, a kind of parasitic load. So if you put on a carbon capture and storage plant onto a, onto a power station, you actually need some energy to drive that carbon capture and storage plant, which in turn reduces arguably the overall efficiency of a, of a power plant as well. Now, um, and, and, each of, and, and this is generally, generally the way it goes. If you're trying to kind of suck 
uh, to simplify it, like carbon emissions from the atmosphere or from flue gases, there's, there's usually this additional energy requirement. So we need to be kind of, kind of careful about it. Having said that, there are always going to be these niche applications where these things make sense. To come to your, the core of your question, though, though Peter, um, there I would, I would answer that there is little work being done in, the, in those different types of technologies. Um, when we think about climate technology, they usually go into kind of different areas. There's the alternative fuels, such as kind of what Lanzatech is, is talking about. Then there's energy, novel energy storage, which is what Shalini is talking about at Tasman Iron. And then there are some other areas like renewable energy, either uh, creating new types of renewable energy or the integration of them into the system. So thanks for your question, Peter. Uh, from Anonymous, next question. Oh, here's a good one. This is, quite, this is quite fascinating. So construction, the construction sector, it accounts for 20% of New Zealand's carbon footprint. Okay, um, yeah, we can, I think we can think about that percentage, but let's just say that the construction sector accounts for a, a, a good proportion of New Zealand's carbon emissions. How can construction businesses derive value from construction waste and create a more circular economy? Who is feeling, who's feeling strong on that one? Bit of hesitation. Well, I mean, I think, I think all of these businesses, I mean, think about the, what's the economic driver behind the decisions that people make. The, the, the economic driver is to, to, to get something that's fit for purpose and, uh, and the least cost. And so today we don't actually we don't actually charge for uh, the climate impact of um, of a particular material or a particular fuel or a particular process. And so one of the one of the things that we need to start considering, as we have, for example, with cigarettes, where we we tax according to the impact of of a cigarette on on, on a person and on society, we need to now start thinking about taxing in the context of CO two. On, on a society or on, on, on the world. Uh, and I think when, when you think like that, you start to, to, to create a situation where different business decisions are being made and different commercial decisions are being made. And in that context, using sustainable materials in building, for example, um, using different sources of plastic in, in building, these, are, these, these become no brainers, these become very obvious and these become cost competitive. I've got a, a thought on that. Yeah, go um, uh, it doesn't, the, the cost to the construction industry um, to demolish something and send it to landfill is, it's, it, it makes more sense for them to do that than it does to have the house or the thing that they're demolishing um, pulled apart and reused. And that is a, that is a price point issue. And that can be done, that can be fixed very easily. Mm. So you can change the incentive um, of the construction industry quite simply by changing the amount that you charge them for their waste. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen some, a piece of architectural um, technology called X-Frame recently um, in uh, an investment committee that I chair called Momentum, um, and they had to go to Australia because the incentive wasn't here um, to use their repurposable modular framing mm. that would allow buildings to be taken apart and it's this this, this lack of long-term thinking it's this like it's cheaper to do this even though it's extremely wasteful so what did australia have that new zealand didn't um better quality plywood mm -hmm. um and a construction industry who were more interested right okay Veronica, can we just broaden that question out? Mm. Because we're kind of getting into a space where um, if we're, say, thinking about construction and demolition waste yeah. from the construction sector, yeah. you know, it, 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 the, the government is considering increasing the landfill costs. Mm -hmm. So that should start to change the, the economics. Um, with Humblebee, do you see, what sort of market signals do you see um, which will encourage your, your customers to kind of move from what they're currently doing to what Humblebee is, is developing? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the market signals are from government and consumer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think from the consumer perspective, people are going, there is, they're hearing more and more about the, the depth of pollution. So you see plastic waste in the bellies of microbes in the deepest parts of the ocean and that level of pollution is really quite terrifying. Like we have quite literally polluted the entire marine food chain 
with plastic and that that feels quite personal because people eat seafood um, and then from a government perspective I think people um, governments are well, I know that they're changing regulations so that um, harmful chemistries uh, to their consumers are being phased out and regulated out um, and they're also going we don't want to be the ones left holding all of this landfill. We don't want to be the ones storing the world's plastic and having it shipped to us. Yep. Um, so we're going to change our regulations um, so that we're not the manufacturers um, literally left holding the kind of plastic baby at the end of the day. Uh, so it's driving pressure throughout the entire supply chain, both from the consumer and the regulatory mm. end. Yeah, so yeah. That, I mean that's, it's really encouraging to hear, isn't it? Yeah. Is that manufacturers and consumers are basically, they sound like they're kind of on the same page. Mm -hmm. They really want to address this problem and where there are viable solutions, even if they might be a couple of years from full scale um, commercialization, that they're, they're getting more and more interested mm -hmm. in those. And it seems to be kind of common across the different areas of clean tech, yeah. climate crisis, water, resource use. And then they seem to all intertwine as well. They do. I feel like regenerative is the word that mm. um, comes to me because smart resource use doesn't isn't just entirely extractive and unsustainable. Um, clean water uh, is like that's re that's regenerative. We have a lot, of, particularly in New Zealand, we have a lot of work to do um, with regard to cleaning up our water um, and climate tech. If you're being regenerative in your, I think in terms of biodiversity, if we're being regenerative in that sense, you touched on it before, then that has an impact on um, on our ability to, to reach our climate targets. Nice one. Thanks, Veronica. That's okay. Let's take another question. I think there was a good one there from, from Alan. Um, where is it? I think it might be the next, oh, there it is. Um, right. Ashton, I'm thinking about, thinking about yourself for this one. Mm. Um, it's a tricky one. Uh, would implementing overseas solutions in New Zealand help lift our clean tech index as well? I might, have a, I might answer that one, but, but the, the next one, uh, why reinvent the wheel if a great solution already exists? Perhaps, perhaps I'll ask you. Um, so uh, implementing overseas solutions in NZ will definitely lift the clean tech index, mm -hmm. but the clean tech index is also, it, it is wonderful actually, because it actually covers the full gamut of, of clean tech. So it's got proven technologies and unproven technologies. Callan Innovation is mainly talking about unproven technologies and the clean tech index is slightly weighted towards the creation of, of new uh, technologies. Ashton. So an interesting question, why reinvent the wheel? Now, the business case for roofing tiles, the, this is our biggest one that we've been working on for the last sort of 10 or 15 years. And um, just, just as Sean was saying, we started, uh, we started with the number eight wire approach where my first fume hood was uh, a cardboard box with an Expel air extractor poking out of it because I was dealing with some smelly chemicals. So, you, you know, we've been working on this for a decade, but the vision is the same. You know, every square meter of our roof has a thousand watts being pumped of sunlight pumped on it. And you work out the average area of your average New Zealand roof is 250 square meters. Uh, do the maths and you can see if you get 650,000 roofs and you could actually actually absorb that total energy You could generate the whole all the energy for the New Zealand economy You, you could do it, the, but the question is why has nobody done it? And you've got huge companies that have uh, various solutions out there Dow powerhouse You've got mr. Uh, Tesla, you know, there's a whole lot of solutions there, but none of them None of them meet that need. Um, we, for example, put out a little product uh, within Dallas the other day, or in February, before the COVID struck, and it actually absorbs, it converts 40% into energy. So you've got 10% electrical, 30% heat, and it will do it. It will generate the total power requirements for the house. And it can be done. And so I get my, I teach a little course at Auckland University on building integrated photovoltaics. I get my students to go away, look at the MED figures, how much energy does the whole of New Zealand industry need? And yes, if you actually convert uh, 650,000 roofs, 
to capture sunlight, yes, you can actually generate the total power requirement. So, you know, your question, how big is our market? Well, how big is the energy market in New Zealand? Mm -hmm. And let's get rid of our reliance on fossil fuels. I'd suggest we convert them all into plastics myself. But anyway, uh, but don't burn them, please. What a waste. Um, but so uh, you say, are we reinventing the wheel? No, we're doing it better in New Zealand. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's, we, that's, we're just doing it better. Yeah, and I think that's a great point because... Um, when you look at the, and, and it's a question that we, we ask ourselves a lot as well, is like, there appear to be solar panels out there already, but not everybody's got them. Um, there are solar panels out there, but they still struggle to get market traction. Um, so the, the role of research and development at, and innovation in creating a better solar panel is still very, very relevant. And there are New Zealand technologies such as MSL and others who are really cracking, cracking into it. And from the outside, it appears to be, it's a bit, bit like Tasman Iron, thinking about batteries. Why on earth would a New Zealand company take on Elon Musk on, at his own game? And the reason is, is because we're pretty nimble, we've got some great ideas, and we actually can get commercial traction, as MSL shows, Avatana shows, and, and Humblebee and Tasman Iron will, 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 are, on, are on the right track as well. So, there really isn't any point replicating existing technologies out there. And what we, talk, what we say to innovators is really understand the, the space that you're in, really understand your competition, not the ones that are just in market, but the trends that are going to lead to new inventions, and try and go deeper, go more quirky, and go more niche as well. Veronica. Just very quickly on that. Um, go for there's it. A, an initiative called the Drawdown Project, which validated um, the best technologies for drawing down um, uh, greenhouse gases, um, and if they were to be, and they're proven, and if they were to be scaled, and so I think that New Zealand, if we've got a problem, say for example with wastewater or sewage, let's look. Let's instead of going, all right, we're going to start from scratch. Maybe let's look and see what else has been piloted, and we could prove out at scale in New Zealand by mm. leveraging it here. So I think there's an opportunity to Anton's point um, and to Shalini's point um, to develop novel stuff here, but I think that we shouldn't just feel like we have to do everything from yeah. scratch. Yeah. yeah, and that, that is really central to Callahan's thinking yeah. as well. There's no point. Reinventing the wheel is a great way, a great way of saying it, mm. but spotting those niches. And the other advantage of looking at existing technologies is we begin to understand the gaps as well and the potential for improvement. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, um, let's move on to some panelist discussions. Uh, for, for the, for, for, sorry some further questions, which I've cooked up myself, rather than other people's. Um, all right, let's go for this one. Um, let's go around each of the businesses that we have in the room and ask, what is your number one challenge for your particular business? I'm thinking we'll start with Tasman Iron here. Uh, what is the number one challenge for Tasman Iron succeeding on the global stage? Um, as you know that I just finished my PhD, mm -hmm. right? And I was a science student for the past 10 or 12 years, and now here I am trying to commercialize this technology. Um, right now, I wish that if I was exposed to the knowledge that exists here, you know, simple things like, what does a term sheet mean? What is, um, you know, the shareholders agreement? How do the IP policies actually play in the new company that we're trying to commercialize? Simple things like that, I mean, I decided that I'm going to go with Tasman Iron. I'm going to commercialize it, and I'm going to be there, you know, in the in the long run. Um, if only, you know, fair IP policies existed. If only uniform IP policies existed all over the uh, New Zealand universities. Um, Victoria University has its own IP policy, and Auckland University has its own. So when I go to these investors, potential investors. All of them are looking for uh, founder-friendly, you know, um, IP policy. But then we have to work, like as Tasman I, I have to work very hard in convincing them that, you know, it is kind of founder-friendly, but not at the moment. Okay. So I feel that um, if Tasman I has to succeed, I mean, we are just starting up. Right? And right now we need to raise more capital. We need to talk to investors from all over the world. And the thing that I've learned so far is that as long as the company um, is um, you know, incentivizing the inventors, you're going to get more uh, investments. Mm -hmm. 
And I feel that after talking to um, the TTOs from all over um, New Zealand... Just let us know what a TTO is. So. Oh, so the TTO is a tech transfer office and that exists in most of the universities here in New Zealand. Um, Auckland University has one, my university has one, and they help us commercialize this technology. So I have the science in my lab, and to commercialize it, to bring it outside the lab, the TTOs help us um, a whole... Uh, they help us a lot. So what I did with Tasman Iron was that um, Wellington Uni Ventures, they helped us get the KiwiNet Tier 1 and Tier 2 fundings. Mm -hmm. And then we filed a patent, and right now we're trying to raise you know, the pre-seed or the angel um, investments. But then again, the problem is that um, the IP policy is not very transparent, and that is something that I have a hard time <clears throat> sorry, convincing uh, the, the future investors. Okay. So I feel that if Tasman Iron has to succeed, then um, we in New Zealand have to make sure that the inventors or, you know, new people like us who are trying to commercialize something, they are aware of these terminologies and they're aware of, of the loopholes that exist in the commercialization world. Yeah. That's, so, uh, that's, that's really interesting, Shalini. So what you're talking about is a lot of the innovation uh, in terms of the kind of underlying research and development is, is coming from the universities yeah. through people such as yourselves yeah. and your colleagues. Yeah. And, then, and then great people like you say, we're going to commercialize this. And you're talking about a whole bunch of barriers mm -hmm. from going from R&D in the university yep. to, to the brutal um, world yeah. of raising money yeah. and being commercial uh -huh. as well. Uh -huh. Um, I'd really like to bring Veronica in here next because uh, Veronica, I know you, I know you helped Shalini out recently with, with some of these issues. What, 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 what do you see from your perspective in terms of the, the number one challenge for Humblebee in terms of getting out and succeeding on that, on that global stage? Um, we had a similar issue with, to Shalini um, in that we wanted to um, use the university to help us commercialise. Um, but the terms were so appallingly bad. And um, luckily for me, my father was a lawyer, so I, was, I, I could tell that they were appallingly bad. Um, and I went outside the university system for that reason. Um, and that meant that I had to pour my own, my own money into the, into the business, which I did. Um, but what that meant was that I wasn't eligible for any of the KiwiNet funding, mm -hmm. any of the pre-seed grants, any of that stuff that would have helped me. So I had to take on venture capital funding very, very early. So that was very hard. And that... And the way that what that does, um, the kind of it fundamentally makes your company less investable because you've had to take on dilutive capital very early at a low valuation, uh, and there's an issue with the attitude that um, institutions in New Zealand have towards intellectual property being generated within their walls, and it's one of a land grab versus a legacy mm. play, um, and institutions in. America go, we want companies to be billion, like they come out of our institutions to be billion dollar companies. They don't go, we're going to take 80% before a pre-seed stage and before you've even raised any capital. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's a real problem. You ha literally hamstring companies before they've even gone out and raised capital. I know people who've tried to commercialise out of Auckland University and who went to raise capital in Australia looked at their, who and investors looked at their cap table and said, we can't invest in this. We have a policy where founders have to be at least 70% and they mm. were already at 20. Mm -hmm. And just, just to zoom into that yeah. particular point, why do investors want founders to have that level of shareholding? It's, a, it's really hard being a founder. There's a lot of personal um, and financial risk. Mm -hmm. It's gruelling. Um, it's difficult and it takes a special person and they want them to stick at it. Yep. Um, so they need to be properly incentivized and that incentive comes with an ownership of the company. And so if you, uh, so say I've been, I've been working on Humblebee, f f you know, four years full time. Um, and if I had only had 10% and the payoff and I was going to have to raise millions of dollars and I was going to get diluted down to 2%, why would I stay? Like what's the, what's the incentive? Okay. And so what we're doing to our innovators is we're kind of we're just hamstringing them from the start yep and that's a massive barrier to awesome. any development regardless of clean tech thank you that was, that was really interesting just to kind of drill into that and get a sense of kind of what investors are after with these early stage businesses mm. and also what it takes in terms of special people to found and, and grow these businesses mm -hmm. as well if i can add to that um so honestly as a scientist I really want to, you know, send Tasmanian batteries out in the space. 
right? They need me to do that. And um, I want to design better batteries that can store more energy and whatnot. But as long as the founders or inventors like me have been incentivized, and you know, we feel motivated. Uh, my PhD supervisor and I, we are the co-founders uh, of Tasman Iron. So as long as we, they keep us motivated, you know, I think um, we're going to stick around Tasman Iron, and we're going to make sure that Tasman Iron, you know, reaches space and water. Like we have these big plans, and we know that it takes a very long time, especially when it comes to batteries. I mean. I think of designing uh, batteries for commercial drones right now, and that's going to take at least two years. Mm. If I plan on competing with Tesla, that's going to take at least six to seven years. So think about sending those batteries into space, that's going to take 10 to 12 years. And the investors, they want these uh, you know, thinkers or, or uh, the scientists to stick with the company that can you know, uh, reach whatever heights they, they, they wish for. So I think that is the reason why they, uh, the inventors, uh, the investors, sorry, they want to make sure that the um, scientists or the inventors are proper, uh, properly incentivized before they invest into that particular company. Yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. And why don't we, thanks for that, Shani. Why don't we turn over to, say, say Sean next, who's, who's stuck with his company for a little while now, and just talk about, I mean, arguably, you're on the way to succeeding at, at a global scale, but I suspect you, your ambition is, is still not fulfilled there. So what, what is the number one challenge for, for Lanza Tech to get to the global scale that it, that it really wants to get to? I mean, interestingly, it, it, all, all of these conversations come down to money. Yeah? So it, 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 and for us, it's, it's no different in that, for us, the, the challenge is now, is now shifted from uh, not being quite so much company fi uh, financing the company as financing projects and, and growing, um, growing the number of deployments we can make and accelerating the, de the rate of deployment of commercial facilities. And, and so looking at new financing strategies, new financing models or financing vehicles for commercial facilities becomes now one of the, the, the challenges we face. Uh, as well as, uh, but 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 actually another challenge we have faced in the past has been legislation um, uh, because we have a technology that kind of led the the way in terms of uh, uh, sustainable thinking around certain resources, um, and uh, and that uh, and our technology has has shown that you can make sustainable fuels from, for example, a waste emission from a steel mill, or you can make sustainable fuels from municipal solid waste. But there are geographies in the world where, you know, the use of municipal solid waste or, or industrial waste for the production of sustainable fuels is not incentivized in the same way that uh, making uh, sustainable fuels from, uh, from biomass is incentivized. So you also come across different parts of the world where legislative inhibition is 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 a is a challenge and we've worked really hard to overcome that mm. and spent spent a vast amount of money overcoming that in different places so so now you look at in in the eu for example the new legislation there incentivizes the use of uh, of industrial waste and municipal solid waste for for sustainable fuel production and that's in large part because of uh, the the uh, the demonstration that we gave of, of, of the potential for this resource and the potential for technology such as ours. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting, Sean, as well. And it kind of takes us on to that point that technologies can sometimes kind of lead the way to enable more supportive regulations overall. Um, we see that to a reasonable extent in water, for example, you know, when you've got a, a set of water quality standards. And the question is, well, how, how can we push, how can we make these water quality standards more stringent and there's, there's a, there are plenty of technologies out there which say you can definitely do better, more frequent, low-cost monitoring, and then visualization and analytics, which give regulators the confidence to say, OK, let's, let's tighten up the, the regulations on water. Really fascinating about that European regs as well. I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, I might look into it separately yeah. from today. I mean, I think, I think the point essentially is that legislators should be legislating for outcomes yep. uh, and not pathways. Mm. And, uh, and, uh, and those outcomes then become the, uh, the focus of, of innovators and entrepreneurs to, to, to fill uh, the, uh, uh, the capability gap. And, and so by clever legislation actually incentivizes um, innovation. 
Nice. Um, dumb legislation inhibits it. Yeah, go for it, Veronica. Um, to the point of smart legislation or legislation that, that holds back, and I'm sure, Sean, you'll, you'll agree with me, that um, New Zealand's policy, blanket policy on genetically modified organisms is a real hindrance to clean tech in New Zealand. Um, yep. We, at hum for Humblebee specifically, it'll mean that we have to go offshore much, much sooner. Mm. Um, I know that there are people who would want to create new protein sources or um, using use synthetic biology and fermentation to create um, uh, milk products or and we we can't do that here we're prohibited based on this very 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 old-fashioned understanding of what um, genetic modification is um, and the threats that it poses to biosecurity nice. yeah I, I couldn't agree with that more I mean uh, essentially today synthetic biology offers an opportunity to convert vast quantities of sustainable resources not only into fuels but also into plastics fibers rubbers polymers of any kind, um, medicines, proteins, et cetera. And so we're in a position now to, to, to engineer biology in ways and uh, uh, at, at a precision that, that was never possible in the past. The, the, the opportunities uh, are, are really just uh, beginning and, uh, and, and New Zealand is really missing out on the opportunity to, to establish uh, synthetic biology-based industries locally uh, because of its legislation right now, I don't think I think it's illegal to grow uh, a genetically modified organism in a reactor in a laboratory in New Zealand at a greater than 10 uh, liter volume, uh, which uh, you know, which is incompatible with anything commercial. Good one. Let's um, let's go to you, Ashton, about this question about the number one barrier for MSL or any of the other businesses businesses that you're involved in in terms of succeeding on that global stage and then we'll cut to some audience Q&A. Well our, our biggest issue is intellectual property of course and retaining our intellectual property. Right. Uh, you've got to make sure that it's not stolen if you like. So yes I am an academic but I really haven't published a paper on what I really do for the last 10 years mm -hmm. because um, I have chosen to have a commercial focus. Uh, to me, I think employing my kids, my PhD students, uh, sorry, they're, they're actual adults, sorry, yes, of um, out of university is more exciting to me than publishing a paper. But after 10 years, just this year, I've been given the go-ahead to publish three publications, which talk about uh, how we can do things, especially catalytic processes, much better. But um, but that's a, that's a choice. That's a choice that I've had to make. Mm. Uh, it, it inhibits my academic career, but I think uh, for commercial success, we actually have to be silent in New Zealand. Mm. Uh, mm. Just uh, getting out a, a uh, you know, putting in a patent and then writing a paper, you've let the world know what you're doing. Mm. And so we've, we have, well, we've got the luxury because we're, we're well funded. We've got the luxury of being able to sit there for 10 years and sit on our thumbs, well, sit on our fingers, not really, but, uh, but not be known by the world what, what we're actually doing. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, success is being quiet until you can get it out there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think our senses, for example, come out next this year or in 2021, and I think right then we have to publish. Uh, our catal our, we have a unique catalytic conversion process. It comes out. It has to be published. Yeah. So great. You know, so that's being silent is the biggest yeah. one. The kind of classic stealth mode. Well, really. Yeah. We're and Kiwis. <laughs> <laughs> and, and at the same time, I presume, Ashton, uh, you're in sort of stealth tech development, but at the same time, you're kind of engaging with those key first customers. You know, you're working on the commercials at, at the same time. So oh, it, absolutely. Yeah. We, we, we have very strong links into Japan, into some of the largest companies up there. Mm -hmm. We have very strong links into some of the uh, you know, universities around Boston, very strong links. Um, so we, we develop those those relationships, of course, yep. uh, and also industries up in Texas. So, you know, uh, we, we just do it quietly. Yep. And in fact, when we're never branded and our company up in the US, uh, I don't even think it has the word New Zealand in it. Yep. But hey, most of the intellectual property is generated down here. The development's all done down here. But we it depends what market you're in. Yep. And we were talking just a little bit, Ashton, just, just to round that one out about that sort of creation of the IP in New Zealand and then essentially the manufacturing elsewhere. Do you see any other models which, which would be 
powerful for New Zealand? Well, but to me, you know, I, I, I don't really want to manufacture in the US. I'd rather we manufactured in New Zealand mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and got the actual benefits here yep. in terms of growing high-tech industry here in New Zealand. So, but we don't see that with the roofing tiles because you're dealing with hundreds of tons of raw materials. It doesn't make sense to ship hundreds of tons down to New Zealand and then ship it back out again as product, no. So therefore, roofing tiles, yes, we have to do that. We do manufacturing of amorphous silicon solar cells in Japan. Why? Because, well, probably health and safety reasons. You can't set up such a plant down here in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. But, but that aside, uh, the ones like sensors and diagnostics, no, the, you're talking about billion dollar markets there. We can do that in New Zealand and, and we can, we can uh, fly boxes of sensors around the world yep. and we will be doing that uh, in New Zealand. Catalytic converters, no, we have some unique intellectual property there and I do believe we can make the, the key electrodes for catalytic conversion and also your batteries for your... Uh, for uh, your, your electrodes for your batteries as well. And I'd have to have a yak about you, with, with you after this. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I just sort of think there are key bits of intellectual property that we can manufacture here. Yep. And that's what we must do in order to really get a benefit back to New Zealand. Yep. Um, so that's great, Ashley. I mean, we're, we're, kind of, we're, we're kind of talking about some different models about how New Zealand can succeed in clean tech from an economic perspective, because we're, we're about creating valuable high-tech jobs here yeah. as well. And what I was hearing you say was that there's a couple of different models there, including that not only the IP, intellectual property around key components, but also the manufacture of those high-tech products as well, which is, which is very, very exciting. And perhaps they would then be exported to another market where the rest of the system would be put together. Yeah, yeah, de definitely. But also incentivizing and encouraging our kids to go through and doing the types of degrees required to support it. You know, I gave a talk at one of the big Tainui uh, hui's down in, um, in the Waikato, and I was just encouraging the young people to do engineering and science. You know, why are we not? You know, you, you, th there's, there's so much passion there, mm. and you need passion. Mm. You've got to believe your own BS, I'm sorry. Yep. Um, you have to believe it, and you've got to be driven. And uh, we, we've, we've actually got a CEO who is completely driven, and uh, he's like the Energizer Bunny, but and but you actually need that. Yep. You need that. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Ashton. Let's let's go to some questions. Um, I really like this one from Kat, uh, which is really talking about um, open sourcing and collaboration. So her question is, how can we approach this, which I presume is NZ Clean Tech, in a more open source and collaborative way for successful impact, rather than the common competitiveness we see between New Zealand companies and institutes. Now the reason that I find this very interesting is that saying collaboration and actually doing it in a genuine way is very, very difficult for businesses, even if they're non-compete. So, we, so, it's, so it, 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 it's a great question. The way that, you know, from a Callahan Innovation perspective we see it is that the first thing to get, well not necessarily the first thing, but one, one way of getting the right sort of collaboration is for, is for the whole of government to collaborate in, in, a, in a sensible way. The next part of that is not just the whole of New Zealand government, but also the institutes around it as well. And by that, I'm talking universities, places like Food Bowl, Level 2, which provide the R&D facilities as well. But then the really thorny part is how do businesses collaborate for, for their own greater commercial success and to have this important environmental impact on the world. Now, I don't know which... Which person would like to go front? Um, please do. Um, I would like to see what, well, like, one of the reasons that Humblebee has been able to collaborate internationally and inter inter institutionally, interdisciplinary, is because we were outside an academic institution, and so we weren't kind of constrained by just working within that academic institution. That has allowed us to draw on expertise that wasn't necessarily in um, uh, one institution. Mm. Um, so that agility came with the freedom of being able to commercialise outside. Um, the other thing is I think that it's, I personally think it's a bit of a travesty that the public does not have access to academic publications that are publicly funded, that they're locked behind a paywall. Mm. Um, I think that's wrong, um, and, I, and I'd love, love to see that change. Um, and I do think that there is um, a cult cultural shift around businesses 
of similar kind in New Zealand starting to work together to take on much bigger companies globally. And I'd love to see more of that supported. Mm. Yeah. So that's interesting. You're talking about, can you just explain that one a little bit so I don't paraphrase you incorrectly? What, what I did hear was mm. that companies with a similar objective mm -hmm. or similar technologies mm -hmm. working together. Yeah. Just, just, just tell us a bit more about it. Um, so for an example that um, I can think of off the top of my head, and I'm sure she won't, won't um, mind me uh, uh, sharing this, is that the, um, the Chia sisters um, in Nelson um, want to give New Zealanders really good quality, and they are amazing quality beverages, um, but to get distribution at a high level um, around New Zealand, you have to compete with Coca-Cola and all of the infrastructure associated with mm -hmm. them. So they banded together with other beverage makers in New Zealand and bought the infrastructure together. Right. So they are competing for the purchase, um, so someone coming in and buying um, a drink, but they are working collaboratively to disrupt um, the stronghold of Coca-Cola within every dairy and every Brilliant. restaurant and da da da, da. Yeah. That's an example. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't totally. it? So you've got a, yeah. a network of small businesses, mm -hmm. a common competitor, and, they, and they, they come together yeah. around it. Sean, I can see you are pretty engaged about this collaboration question as well. Yeah, I mean, so we've, we've collaborated uh, with a number of different uh, companies that, that have very complementary technology. And I think, you know, we're all looking to develop our our particular technology in a way to, to, to address certain market needs, but 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 our our individual technologies fit in, in a framework, fit in a in a in a larger context. Uh, for us, we've collaborated, for example, with companies that have CO2 electrolyzers, so they can take CO2 and they can reduce it down with sustainable power to a molecule that then we can convert into into fuels and chemicals, so that now you can make fuels and chemicals from sustainable electrons and CO2. We've collaborated with groups that have different organisms that you can put in, in reactor systems that, that, that we've scaled in order to expand the number of, uh, of sustainable products that can be made through the kinds of fermentation um, uh, uh, strategies that, that we've developed. And, and, and you know, everybody benefits from this because we show uh, a, a greatly expanded opportunity for, for our technology and, and they do too. And so I think, it's, I think it's essential that there is collaboration, uh, but it, it generally works in the con uh, in contexts where you're you're either both going to benefit from from a single outcome and you're not competing necessarily technically mm. um, so so I think that's that's you know you don't have to overlap technically but but see some some synergistic uh, growth in opportunity through that collaboration mm. yeah yeah no, I actually think companies work together very well mm. Uh, when, like Sean was saying, when we're not actually competing for the same market, but we can see some synergies there, uh, I, I, I don't think I don't think that's really an issue at all. Okay, um, is that not an yeah. issue within New Zealand or kind of internationally, or are there some other kind of patterns you, you've, you've kind of come across? Well, no, I, I think um, you, you know if if people can see benefit out of what we do. And we, we're only a small player globally. Mm. If we can add value to somebody else's product, sure, why not? Yeah. Why, why don't we the work together? The hard part is finding those synergies. It's like, it's, it's finding the company that your tech could be used in that would benefit them and you. It's mm. that creative, it's, it's a lot of research, it's a lot of time, it's a lot of putting um, links together that you wouldn't necessarily, they're not necessarily business as usual. And that's the really hard thing. And um, maybe that's something Callahan kind of Innovation could with. You're, you're almost leading to one of our final questions. Oh, there. good. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliantly placed. Um, okay, now there's been a few questions come up. Uh, I can see Sean Malloy of Avatana and others have been asking a kind of similar thread of questions. Um, are there enough garages slash basements available for all New Zealand innovators, which is, <laughs> which is, a, which is a great question. Um, and then that, this question about what resources will Callaghan Innovation or government in general commit to this goal and get us, getting us into, into the top 10. Um, I, I, I can speak from experience about the first question about are there enough garages and basements. Mm. We have a, we're working with a really interesting business at the moment and they struggle to find, to find like a 40 meter test facility. Mm. And it took them a long, long time at the the, the cost, the availability, the health and safety concerns mm -hmm. just kind of went on and on. They cracked it in the end. 
during COVID as well, which is awesome to see. Um, so I think there probably are enough um, R&D facilities out there, but difficult to get, get hold of them for many people. Difficult to get hold of them and then also difficult to retain ownership of your intellectual property if you're hiring them to do it or right. if you're... If you're a, 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 I mean, this whole garages and freds and sheds attitude that we have, um, if you're not able to access funding from those garages and sheds, um, you have to go to university to do it and yeah. pay for the, the, the pleasure of being able to access government funding. Um, and then that hamstrings your company. Like, what, op what pathways are we, are we offering our creatives sitting and tinkering in sheds mm. um, if it's just that one track? That has a, I mean, th this is really why uh, an organisation or, or a, um, a facility like Level 2 is so important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really think, you know, if, if I look at the history of Lanzatech, you know, we wouldn't exist if it wasn't for, for, for that facility and the freedom it afforded us to, uh, to, to experiment uh, with toxic flammable gases in, in a biological <laughs> fermentation process. And I don't think it's any, any coincidence that... You know, Lanzatech came out of the facility that is now level two, and so did Rocket Lab. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and, and so these are two organizations that have entirely different technologies, entirely different um, uh, requirements. But we both came out of the same facility, and, we, and we've both, uh, to date, been tremendously successful as a result of that founding. Uh, and, you know, it used to, really, used to really amuse me that you'd have all these um, incubators that were uh, that had all this structure around them with with people who are fascinated to to advise you on your business having never run a business of their own uh, whereas in level two um, we had none of that in fact what we were encouraged to do is is become independent be independent have independent uh, uh, businesses that grew uh, with with their own unique culture uh, to 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 reflect the the unique technologies that uh, those businesses we're seeking to develop, and uh, guess what? It was successful. Awesome, and, sure. and I think, uh, and I, you know, my, my sincere hope is that Level Two will carry on that tradition yeah. of of fostering Kiwi innovation uh, in a way that allows it to be independent, free spirited, uh, and uh, and and truly innovative, uh, and not not trying to fit into some pre preordained kind of innovation mold that uh, that is somewhat outdated and poorly informed. Okay, thank you all. I can see Shalini, you want to go for it. Just, we, we've got, uh, we've just, got not too much time, but just. Uh, just talking about level two. Um, every time I've spoken um, with, you know, people from level two, they've always offered us, you know, the lab space for making Tasman iron batteries. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to say that out loud. Um, because, you know, like we are in the R&D stage and someone just saying that, that, you know, we have these uh, facilities here where you can test your batteries and whatnot, that meant a lot. That, so, that, that is awesome to hear. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, so I'm kind of getting the, uh, a broad sense that facilities like Level 2 mm -hmm. are really helpful mm -hmm. if we want to do research and development-led yeah. clean technology. Yeah. Clean tech is not like SAS. You can't just, like, you know, go in a garage and, and spend a week writing some code or a weekend writing some code and shipping it an MVP. Like, that is just not how deep tech, clean tech works. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that um, international investors asked me was, why are you taking private funding so early? Um, and it's because even grants like Callaghan require there to be a private equity match. And that is not the case in other countries. Mm -hmm. There are grants where you can get kind of 50, 100, $300,000 to progress your, your technology to a point that it is investable. Because what we're doing by, A, we're, we're limiting the number of deep tech companies that will be started in New Zealand by, by having policies like that. But also you're asking your angel and your venture capital base in New Zealand to take a higher risk um, in, their, in their portfolio, which you know they will have limited appetite for. So again, yep. you... That's a great point. Yeah. Thank you, Veronica. Pleasure. And can I just thank everybody who's, who's been watching for your questions. It's been really, really good. And I'd particularly like to say thank you to Sean Simpson Veronica, Ashton, and Shalini for your, for your commentary as well. Um, we were talking about this before we went on air. And you know your views today are really going to help us shape up this NZ Clean Tech for the World two-year plan, which we're working with Callahan Innovation and other, other organizations to really pull together. So your inputs today are being much appreciated. Th thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So as our namesake, Sir Paul Callaghan said, 100 inspired New Zealand entrepreneurs can turn this country around. We've had many, well, many more than 100 talented Kiwis join this event today. So New Zealand's in great hand, is in great hands if, if that's anything to go, go by. So we know COVID has thrown a spanner in the works of many businesses, both in, in New Zealand and globally. And it's humbling and inspiring to have innovators like the four of you and many online today. So this is in line of the thinking of Sir Paul Callaghan. He encouraged us to be proud to, to back inspiring and forward thinking clean tech innovators. So we're driven by Sir Paul's vision to make New Zealand a place where talent truly wants to live. So to, to remind everybody, Callaghan Innovation's purpose is to activate innovation, help businesses grow faster for a better NZ by connecting people, opportunities and networks providing tailored technical solutions, skills and capability development programs, as well as, as Veronica mentioned, research and development funding. We look forward to supporting all clean tech innovators out there on your journey. Feel free to get in touch with us. Again, thank you to our panelists. And a reminder that you can get a recording of this presentation. Certainly we'll be pouring through it as well and picking out the nuggets. So keep an eye on your inbox for this and we'll be sending the survey your way don't be shy on that. Just, just let us know what you thought and provide any other suggestions as well. OK. Um, and in closing, finally, a reminder to visit the Callahan Innovation website. Download the free Waste to Value report. Don't hesitate to contact us for more information and support. Enjoy the rest of your day. Kia pai, tōrā.